I'm Catherine Arnott Smith, and uh, in a conversation before this kicked off, I was astounded to realize that I've been teaching at least one course distance a year since 2002, either here or Syracuse University, which totally freaks me out. I don't know where all that time went. Uh, but I am a, uh, my field is actually medical informatics, so which is the field that Epic came from, and because of the very big areas of academic life, I teach in an information school where we, we are primarily a graduate program, which is an odd thing to be in an R1 campus. Uh, we do have undergraduate classes, and so I kind of swing between, here I swing between teaching um, uh, classes of 15 to 30 graduate students online, but then in the summers I do a very large undergrad online, which uh, last summer was uh, started at 175, and about three weeks into the eight week summer session it was 150, which is the, I actually counted this last summer, and that's the kind of attrition I see, uh, because with undergrads, you may have all noticed this, there's always this period where they're like, oh my god, this is a real class. <laughs> And so that leads into the need to have good data to tell me what people are actually doing in the class because it's mostly for the undergrads that I worry about this, but frankly I see it with the grads too that some of them are so new to doing distance at all uh, that they, they simply forget, just like you forget about an important email sitting in your inbox that you totally mean to get to and then next thing you know it's the end of the day. They have that same problem, and so I actually rely on uh, the data coming out of the course management system, whatever that system is, to in part to tell me, is there somebody who needs some intervention quick? And so I actually direct my TAs to deal with kids who it looks like just haven't logged on. <laughs> you know, when we're like a week into the class and the class is eight weeks long, that's a problem. So um, I use data in my grading, but I, I would say that I, I use it just as much to inform me about students that are having problems that I want to nip in the bud. Uh, so what I wanted to show you was a way that I am wrangling with Canvas not doing what D2L did. So I was extremely reliant on all those wonderful numbers that came out of D2L telling me what content somebody had tapped on uh, or quote unquote read. Uh, every week, and with Canvas not doing that very easily, although there are there are workarounds that I'm learning to use, but it isn't as out of the box ready uh, with Canvas. Uh, what I found was that I had to change how I assessed um, participa participation in discussion forums, and that was one of the first you know big takeaways for me uh, in the switch to Canvas was what was it making me think about different ways to do, um, and so. Uh, I ended up working with a participation rubric, which I will show you um, in this class, which has a graduate enrollment of 28. And this is a very library-specific class. There's no undergrads in here, although I do often teach mixed classes, not this one. So I post the rubric for them to see in my course mechanics folder. And this participation rubric was not my own invention. Oh, it's working. Okay. Um, it was not my own invention, but I got it through my participation in um, the Teach Online at UW thing. I was in that first cohort that went through, uh, directed by Karen Skiba, uh, which was actually a really, really great year. And this was a resource I got from a site they shared in that class. And so somebody came up with this rubric. Um, I can send this to anybody who wants it, but it's Creative Commons, and they just ask that you credit it like CC usually does. And so I post this and point students to it if they get confused. Um, but it breaks the goals for discussion down into nice discrete parts. And um, I'm not a huge believer, I, I really don't like rubrics for written work very well, but I find that this works super well for discussion. The reason I don't like it for written work is that I see too many students, even the grad students, thinking that this is what they must do, and they follow this cookie cutter mold, and they think, if I deviate from this mold at all, I will do badly in this course, and I just hate that. So it's the same reason I don't like to post examples of good papers, although I do because people scream if I don't, <laughs> because I inevitably get you know clones of the good paper, and that's really not what I want to see. 
Um, but for discussion, I found this actually has really helped a lot. So I'm kind of I'm more of a believer in rubrics for certain things than I used to be. So I have a criterion for responsiveness to a discussion assignment prompt. And in my classes, I very seldom do talk about this sort of discussions. Mine are usually uh, go out, each student um, individually, go to the web, find a thing, the thing depending on what we're talking about that week. Uh, it might be data. It might be, you know, go find your hometown library and tell me how many, uh, how many hospital libraries are open to the public within a 30 mile radius. I do things like that. And then they bring that thing, whatever they were directed to go out and look for, back to the class. And that completely prevents people saying, I agree with Sally. You know, <laughs> it, those all go away Plus because one. everybody's, yeah, every, it's very active learning. They're all doing their own thing and it's just impossible to clone those responses. I will typically only do, you know, prompts that are question asking the very first week of the class when everybody's still so getting to know each other and, you know, figuring out how this works. So responsiveness to the prompt is broken down by, you know, uh, did you do a super job uh, reporting back everything I asked for the first time? And this is where I've actually seen the greatest improvement over what I used to see in D2L. It's like just by, and I had a rubric up in D2L too, but for some reason in Canvas, this is working way better. I'm not sure why. Um, so I will say, please tell me everything the first time. Uh, that sort of slides down from there to all, all the way to core, where it's like they basically did half or less of what I asked for the whole week. <laughs> not good. Then there's application of content, which gets down to, can I tell reading these? posts that you read the readings, that you did the other stuff there was to do this week, whatever that was, lecture readings, whatever, quizzes. Uh, then there's responsiveness to group discussion, which is, it gets down to, are you talking with a bunch of other classmates about multiple topics? Uh, so it's basically rewarding them for being uh, communicative and not just sitting in a little corner by themselves and not talking to anybody. Uh, and the time <coughs> is, is that probably one thing that has helped the most is that well distributed throughout the week basically amounts to, if I, if I log on to SpeedGrader, which I'll show you what I do in a second, and I see that somebody posted five times in the last five minutes before the class locks at five o'clock, eh, uh, not good. And so there's a way to grade down for that. Um, and then it sort of goes up from there so that postings that are sort of liberally sprinkled throughout the week end up getting a higher score than, and, and most students are in the middle. They're, they're neither super, super last minute or very well sprinkled. Um, and the, the thing I like is that people can do actually well in the first three rows and eh, in the last row and come out okay, which is, I think it's a realistic way to assess when people actually have time to talk and talk well. Um, so that's how the students see the rubric. And then how it works, I'll actually attach a rubric right now. I left one unattached purposely. Um, so what I have going on this week in this class that closes at 5 p.m. tonight is these were student selected articles where they could either choose from a list that I gave them or they could recommend one of their own that I just had to quote unquote approve first. So what this is is a range of literatures about um, things in library collections. So it's everything from book challenges, which is an extremely real life problem that all kinds of librarians face, to this one, which is actually from Salon, and is about, it's a controversial piece about how the LGBTQ publishing industry is diminishing hugely because everything's become so mainstream, and so you don't find as many niche publishers anymore, and that's one example. And so it's got lots of implications for collections because if you're looking for particular small presses independence to give you stuff, they're dying <laughs> because some of this has got so mainstream. So anyway, it's a range of different things, and people just join in talking about whatever they want to talk about. Each student that presented an article is responsible for hosting that little room this week. And the whole class doesn't work like this, but this one week does. 
And so there is one topic that I still have to attach rubric to, and this is how you do it. It's a piece on ROI or bust. How do libraries justify collections? So you have to open up, I've already said it is graded. So you open up the discussion, click on the little gear thing, and say add rubric. And a little too many steps, but if you say find a rubric, then you go look for existing rubrics. And it's called participation rubric. Say so use this one. Boom, and we're done. So that's all there is to it. And let me show you last week's discussion to show how it plays into SpeedGrader. Um, So I actually really like SpeedGrader, and I particularly like it for grading participation with a rubric, because what you can do, not everybody gets graded every week, but I have a randomized table so that in this particular class, um, every student is graded twice randomly. They don't know when they're being graded. So it's sort of the, you might get called on a class model. And so no student gets assessed more or less than two times. After the first time, I grade them using this rubric in SpeedGrader, then I email them and in the comments, I say, you did great, just do that one more time before the end, you know, end of week 12 and everything will go well. Or I say, eh, not so great, but you got one more shot sometime before week 12. So I submit the grade the first time. I don't submit the grade the second time. I just save it because if I, if I submit it, I know there are a number of students who will just simply stop doing anything whatsoever. <laughs> um, so that's how the rubric works. So what you see here is that not everybody has a completed dot because not everybody got graded that week. Oops. Sorry. Oh, I know why he's not submitted. <laughs> That's it. Of course, duh. So they show up as ungraded. Um, find somebody who actually graded. Here's back from week three. So here is a student who got 9 out of 10 points. And so what you're seeing here on the left is it's basically everything I need to know about what that student did during that week. And so you're seeing that he got, yeah, he did very well. And his, <laughs> this is somebody who likes to share images, particularly Magritte paintings, which I love. Um, you didn't know that about me before we started the class. Um, so this person talked quite a lot, but my very first act when opening up a student I'm assessing in the speed grader is to see what the time range is. And so I could just see, you know, really quickly, this person posted quite a few times all week. It was really a nice job. And it makes it quite easy to read. Um, there's just something about all that white space in Canvas that makes a big difference. And so this is how the, um, the rubric actually gets used in SpeedGrader. Um, and then I can just make all the comments I want. So, so I have found SpeedGrader a huge time saver over this particular class. The, the basic method hasn't changed very much for years, although the content does. The basic, what I grade for hasn't changed very much. And I find this goes, I, I'd say, twice as fast as it did with the 2 l which, in which I also used a rubric. Um, and I'm not sure why, except that it's just visually more appealing or something. I don't know. So that's basically what I had to say. Great.